So XBRL is an international format standard, but it's also a consortium of organizations, over 550 organizations from all over the world. There are some 27 countries involved. It's like a United Nations consortium activity. These people get together, they vote, they collaborate, they work on this standard uh, on an international scale because there's no such thing as a proprietary standard or a standard that's unique to a specific country. So this is a laundry list of some of the public uh, case studies and implementations around the world. And I'm going to talk about a few of these that I'm highlighting here. So the first one here is the U.S. banks. Uh, the U.S. banking regulators implemented XBRL in 2005, and if you're a U.S. bank today, you report in the XBRL format on a mandatory basis. They just implemented it full stop. Now, before XBRL, uh, the error rate of call reports was 68%, and it took them 45 days to do the analysis, and there were about 1,000 people involved in the process. Now, after they implemented XBRL, in fact, in the first quarter of implementation, the error rate went from 68% to 5%. The processing cycle went from 45 days to under two days. And the number of people involved went from over 1,000 to under 200. Again, it's not about the technology, it's about the cost savings and process enhancements. Now, how did they do that? Well, it's a very simple idea. In today's supply chain, in any kind of analysis activity, the consumer is responsible for validation and analysis. So think about it, if you're an analyst, you got to get the information, you got to do the analysis, you have to make sure what you got is correct. Well, that's the problem. And that happens at a data warehouse and an enterprise, it happens in the external supply chain, it happens all along the supply chain. So what the banks did, the regulators did, is they articulated not only the information model in XBRL, but the validation rules and the analytical rules, such that they could push those back to the repairers, the banks. And in doing so, the banks then were able to provide clean data with the answers to all the analytical questions the first time they submitted them. Okay? So a reaction is, well, what did the banks think of that? So the bank regulators interviewed the banks, and I sat in on some of those meetings. And so you got, you know, 15 or 20 bankers there, and the regulators say, well, what do you think of this new process? The banks all look at each other like, what do you mean? Well, what do you, how do you like this new process where you have to do the validation and the analysis? Do you like it, or is it a big pain in the neck for you? Because, you know, we're concerned that it's more work for you. The banks are like, no, we love it. We think it's great. Well, can you tell us why you think it's great? Yeah, because you guys, in our you're not in our face every two weeks asking us a bunch of stupid questions. That's why we think it's great. We get to prepare the reports the right the first time, and we don't hear from you guys every two weeks for the next three months. You go away. So the idea in pushing validation analysis back to the beginning was you do it right the first time, you get quality answers that pass through the supply chain in an efficient manner. U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission, they have a voluntary filing program. I'll get into that in a little bit more in, in a minute. The Bank of Spain, there's over a million companies just in Spain that are already reporting in the XBRL format, a million, okay? From everything from anti-money laundering for the banking sector to statutory reports for the commercial sector, uh, widespread adoption in Spain. Now, you'll notice that most of these are agencies, except over the left-hand side, it says Australian government and Dutch government. I'll get into those in more detail in a minute, but the point here is that the governments have adopted this, not an agency, okay? So it's a government-wide adoption model. It's not a single agency. Here's some of the companies that are participating in the voluntary filing program. Over $2 trillion in market cap leading companies from the U.S. capital markets. And some foreign registrants in here as well, like Infosys from India. Um, United Technologies Corporation, so, um, most of these companies, any questions so far? Most of these companies are preparing their reports and then they're structuring them in XBRL, okay? Now when, when um, of course there's no barcode on this bottle of water, but you can think about a barcode on your Coke, can of Coke or Pepsi, all right? That barcode, when it was first introduced, it was applied by inventory clerks in the stores, okay? So the grocery store managers took them about three weeks to figure out Hey, this is a dumb idea. The manufacturers ought to put the tags on. And so the rest is history. That whole process has completely changed the way the retail grocery environment works. Well, the same thing is occurring here. The companies are tagging the reports at the end of the supply chain, and companies like United Technologies are starting to push that back further. Okay? So you end up with United Technologies adopting this. It's not a bolt-on, add-on at incremental cost. 
they've actually identified that they're going to reduce their cost of reporting by 20 to 25 percent. Okay? So it's not an incremental cost idea, it's a way to reduce costs. Again, for the finance and accounting people, that's a good thing. Any standardization effort has these kinds of economic benefits. I don't care if it's XBRL, it's the barcode, standardized railroad gauges, all the same kind of concepts. And so if you're looking at this in a process activity, and I'll show you some detailed process in a minute, these are the economic benefits you should expect. Hitachi has a product called Zimba. It is an Excel plugin that allows you to do magical things with Excel. Excel is sort of the accountant's hammer. So in PricewaterhouseCoopers, we do a lot of analysis, and our accountants use Excel. And prior to Zimba coming along, our analysis was manually load the data in the Excel worksheet, do my modeling, and then I'm done. And so what happened there is you had a lot of manual loading activity, I call it longshoreman's activity, and then all the intellectual property was wrapped up in the worksheet. So person number one could not share that intellectual property with person number two. So we had a lot of knowledge that was sort of buried in these silos. With Zimba, I'm able to sit in Excel, point it at the SEC at your database, and have it come to me inside of Excel. I can pick the companies I want. Those reports come right into Excel just in a matter of seconds. My model is loaded. I'm able to look at the analysis, the results of my analysis. There's no access time. There's no validation time. There's not even any analysis time except for me just looking at the results of the analysis. So it's completely streamlined how we do analysis. Okay? Now, here's the kicker. In our firm, we spent roughly $100 million on knowledge management activities in the last two years. We built this environment for less than a million dollars. The $100 million involved a lot of communication, a lot of noise around marketing internally and announcing it to our people. Zimba got zip. There was no email, there was no announcement, it was not promoted at all. All it was done is we released it to the analytical community and we began providing them with backdoor you know, um, assistance. When they had a problem, we'd just do customer service. Six months later, this platform is the highest traffic tool within our entire commercial domain, within six months. It cost us less than a million dollars to build. In the first year alone, we reduced our cost of buying outside data by three million bucks. So we have a net two million dollars in our pocket as a result of going to this model. Okay? Again, it's about cost and process enhancements. Let me transition now. XBRL is a way to format information, and you, so you have structured concepts, or taxonomies we call them. It's really just a, a framework for information. So if you're an accountant, that's called the conceptual accounting framework. Well, this is another framework. It's a broader framework. It includes things around management, discussion, and analysis. And so you have uh, another consortium focused on content, international in scope and nature. Uh, it's designed to attack key business segment areas and KPIs. An example of this is the Investment Company Institute Risk and Return Taxonomy. This was an idea, a gleam in somebody's eye a year ago. They got 50 funds together. They built a taxonomy to specifically define risk and return for investors. Because if you're looking at a fund, what you want to know is what's the risk of the return of the fund? What's the return of the fund? And so now you can basically point and click at those funds. That information will show up in your model very, very quickly. Um, there's other industry sectors that are work in process, but at the EBR 360 site, you can go there and learn about this framework. You can download it and use it yourself. And um, in fact, Infosys, the Indian company I mentioned earlier, they've been using the EBR framework in their annual report since 2005. And this is just the general framework idea. You'll notice in this framework, there's really nothing in here that's not already in your current reports. 